Donna? I don't think it can get any better than that. I should stop now. Go, Donna. <laughs> Who's heard of the Digitise the Dawn campaign? I, I really don't. Like, okay, who hasn't? So this is for all of you. <laughs> I think there's a five of you, six, six of you. Okay, so um, Digitise the Dawn uh, is about getting Louisa Lawson's journal online. Um, Louisa Lawson um, is sadly more famous for being Henry Lawson's mother than for the way more awesome things she did in her own right. And one of them was publish a newspaper from the late 1800s until the early 1900s. This is a kind of fact of today. If it's not online, it doesn't exist. So uh, I'm glad you're all sitting down so that this cat can ask you the question and explain to me why I found these pictures of myself on the internet. This is increasingly true, that we have an expectation that we will find things online. And it was the fact that I had this expectation um, that led me down this particular um, path. Um, this is me, I'm Donna Benjamin. Uh, you can tweet at me and I'll take Bonnie's cue of please tweet at me wildly, um, at Catacrab um, on the Twitters. Um, I also work for Catalyst IT, so if you want to email me, you can do that. Um, Louisa Lawson, she did this newspaper, she was a suffragist, she wrote poems, she was um, involved in uh, all sorts of really kind of awesome things way, way back in the late 1800s. These are some images of uh, her stuff. One of the other things she did was she was an inventor. She invented this buckle um, because she had to deal with a whole lot of, uh, she was working in a post office and had to deal with mail bags and they weren't very well fastened. So she invented a better post bag mail fastener and this is her, her, um, her patent for it. So she was kind of cool. Um, she has been immortalised on stamps. The one on the right was the one that actually got made. The other two were just um, designs that also got considered. Uh, there's a park in Marrickville here in Sydney that um, has this awesome mosaic of a cover of the dawn, from the dawn, a journal for the household as it became known. Uh, there's some paperwork about uh, her various dealings, her, um, her patent, her business dealings, her property purchases and stuff. So a lot of stuff has been collected about her. Um, and I knew about the Dawn. I can't remember how I knew about the Dawn, but I had this expectation that it would be available online. Um, why? Well, I went, I was doing um, a talk actually at LCA 2011, a mini comp for Hex and Miniconf. I did a talk about women in technology. So I thought, oh, I should be able to find some cool stuff about early, you know, women in tech stuff going on, probably in the pages of the dawn. So I kind of thought I'd go looking and, you know, all this sort of stuff. But what I found was that the dawn wasn't online. It wasn't in Trove. Um, and I found this perplexing and um, I contacted the National Library and said, so why isn't the Dawn online? Well, it hasn't been digitised. Um, so when are you going to digitise it? Well, not any time soon. But, you know, if people want to pay to get stuff digitised, I went, so how much would it cost? Turns out, not that much. So I set about raising some funds, asked a few questions, should I do this? I kind of sanity checked it and a few people went, Yes, yes, that's a very good idea. Yes, you should do that. So I started a chip in, I created a website, I created a Twitter account, and as you can tell, this was some time ago from the Twitter logo. Um, <laughs> so this was over five years ago. Eventually we raised, uh, we raised the money, I got support from the National Foundation of Australian Women um, who helped amplify and sit, sort of spread the word. The National Library also came on board and were hugely supportive, quite excited that someone was doing something so crazy. And, you know, long story short, we raised the funds, we digitised the dawn. Well, actually, the library did. This is a picture of the only remaining physical copy of this newspaper. It's not even quite complete. I think there's a, there's a volume missing. Um, they were going to scan the microfiche, of which there are copies in many libraries around um, the country, but the quality of the microfiche was so poor, they eventually, they actually went back to this and scanned the physical copies. 
And uh, they did their QA and the rest, as they say, is history. On, the tw on um, Women's, International Women's Day 2012, they released The Dawn online in Trove. Huzzah! <laughs> Very cool. Um, I, I gave a talk about this um, at the Sydney Mechanics School of Arts where Louisa happened to often have meetings and there is an article about the Sydney Mechanics of Arts in the dawn, which kind of felt like a very nice bringing things together. Um, and, you know, now that it is online, you can go and dig around and find cool things like these kinds of pictures and ads. I just think they're fabulous. And some of them I've gone through um, with my other main love, Inkscape, if you want to know more about that, come to my tutorial on Thursday. But um, can, I've traced bitmap these and put them into um, Wikipedia Commons and open, um, open clip art and stuff. So, you know, there's just really good stuff in there. The Dawn is an amazing resource. So I really wanted to very quickly go through sort of the history of that campaign because that's not what I want to talk about today. Um, actually, this is... Fiona was going to demo earlier fixing the text, and this is just a static screenshot of it. That is one thing we definitely need help with. There's still some really dodgy OCR in the dawn, and it's you know, something that um, uh, people can participate in, and we've created a bot. I'm not sure if I'm using Rags bot or not, but um, the Digitise the Dawn Twitter account now tweets an article a day from the dawn. It's around midday, I think it said. It just posts some random thing, um, and, you know, the, it gets fixed. The main thing that um, the main thing I wanted to say is that I know of at least two research papers that um, directly credit the online version of the Dawn, and I've had um, other people tell me that you know the fact that it is online has allowed them to get on and do their research. So that's just really gratifying. This was just a thing that was kind of like an irritation to me at the time, which spurred me on to kind of run the campaign and get this to happen, but it has become, you know, bigger than that. And I think that's really awesome. So what I wanted to do at this, in this forum was to say, well, what can we learn from that? And I posed three questions. Um, if you read the abstract rather than have just turned up here today, you'll know what those three questions are. So I'm just going to quickly go through them um, and then see if we can huddle a little bit and have a bit of a chat. Um, but before we do that, I just want to check in that these are the right questions. Like maybe, given who we are and who's here today, there might be different questions that you want to explore. But these were the ones that occurred to me. So given the Digitise the Dawn campaign, the fact that it's now online, the question is, so now what? Like, can we learn from that? Is that something we could replicate for other sorts of cultural heritage that perhaps is not on anyone's priority list except some particular groups? Is there a very perhaps local um, publication or collection or something that's not going to ever get the funding that it needs, but you know there are people who care enough about it to kind of rally and make it happen? Is there something where we could like find un underutilised scanning resources that uh, are sitting in dusty corners in institutions that we could harness as technologists and free? I don't know. So how can libraries, archives and communities work together to increase access to our cultural heritage? That's one question. Let's say we can, and what should we do with the knowledge once it's freely available? And here's a big question. How do we ensure it lives on if the institutions who host it are defunded? That would never happen. That would never happen. <laughs> Let's hope not. Um, but I think when I was first posing this, uh, there was talk about the National Library's funding being cut, that Trove may not have money to continue and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, I think enough of us made noise, but this is real. And we know that funding comes and goes and that institutions can be very program based and that there's a lot of money at a short, in a short amount of time to do a particular thing and then that money goes away. But the power of community persists. So that's sort of what I wanted to explore, that kind of intersection of, of technology, of culture and of activism. So going back. How can libraries, archives and communities work together to increase access to our cultural heritage? Is that a question we want to explore today? Yes. yes. Thank you. 
All right, cool. So um, I don't want this to be me talking. I want, I want you to talk and I want then us to have some feedback. And because we don't have a runner mic, I will repeat back things. But if you can sort of huddle a little bit, and I feel like, you know, I think there's a little kind of huddly thing. I think there's a sort of, looks like a bit of a huddle over there and a bit of a huddle over there. And you're a little bit of an outlier up there. Hello. You might need to come down a bit because you're a bit far away. And I think if you could probably tuck in there with, with or maybe around here. Anyway, so, yeah, I just want to just take a few minutes. How can libraries, archives and communities work together to increase access to our cultural heritage? And for you watching the video at home, perhaps just go make a cup of tea. <laughs> Yes, a different question. An answer from you guys, but I think this is an unknown knowns thing. <laughs> <laughs> no. If this is one journal you found, um, I didn't other, find it. What other journals are missing that aren't digitised? What other artefacts from early Australian history or white history, at least, are we missing? Um, what gazillions? Digitised that should be. All sorts of things, and I think that's part of the part of the journey we have to go. And I think the the low, like hyper local stuff, with uh, you know with very small communities of interest around it, are probably the sorts of things that languish. But there might be other people in the room who can answer that sort of question better than I. I mean, uh, Hugh, I don't know if you um, you know there was, a sun, there was a Sunshine newspaper. Is that digitised and available through the Brimbank Library? Sort of. Yeah, so we've got, like, there's the, so Trove, which we talked about earlier, there's actually a program um, which the National Library is doing with local newspapers in particular. Yep. And so every year they take another batch and they say, we're digitising this newspaper. The big problem with digitising local newspapers is um, that eventually you hit the copyright wall and then you have to stop. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and sometimes you don't, you know, they're often works actually, the publisher doesn't exist anymore. anymore. I think it's everything up until like 1920 something is yeah. fine. And 1955. So sort of to answer for the, um, for the recording, um, there are lots of things that are not digitised. The Trove um, digital newspaper, digitising newspaper program is going through like the archives of newspapers and digitising lots of them. And some of the local newspapers are being digitised sort of in batches. There's kind of like a backlog of them and they can only get through so much at a time. Does that sort of answer your question? Yeah. Cathy. Um, it picks up on the backlog point that you just made. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Do we have a national digitisation backlog? Great question. Do we have a national digitisation backlog? Now, I know Trove has the newspaper one and big all the big national newspapers have been done most of the capital city newspapers have been done but they're now doing the little ones um, but they you know the women's weekly was was one that they talked about with great fanfare and it's great online because it's got lots of color pictures so it's pretty um, so they do but are there other things good question and is someone can someone take some notes so we can maybe follow up with some of these really good questions my, my question was similar yes i wonder if there is a a list at the National Archive of, of, of things that they plan to digitise yes. over time and whether that whether there's open access to that list. They do. There is a list. They, they put out, I think, I think annually, but other more accurate information may need to be sourced, but I think annually they publish the list of what's, what's coming up. And then you can subscribe to a thing that tells you um, this is what is now available. So the national, the, digi the, di the newspaper digitisation one specifically, but it's all the other stuff. Yes, I guess my question went to, you know, what's not on that list in their collection that may come onto the list in future years. But, but that's the point of leverage that you got onto here, is if you discovered something that wasn't yet on that list. Yeah. And you were able to bring private funding to that, which expedited. Yes. How do I summarise that? So what we're saying is there are there. What are other things in their collection that are not on that list yes. that we think are worthy and should yes. be prioritised or have private funding found for them? Yeah. Who's doing the prioritisation? Who's doing the prioritisation? 
Yes. Is there some kind of mandate on what should be digitized? Sorry? Is there some kind of mandate on what should be digitized? Is there some kind of mandate on what should be digitized? Great question. So the, in, the, in the sort of curation side of things, like, you know, we can't digitise everything immediately, so what should we digitise first? What should we not bother digitising? Do we have things that are at risk that deteriorate as we go that we can say, we only have so many years to the way these are stored that can be digitised, or not all in, like, nitrogen or whatever it can be decaying? So repeating, so, you know, things like, you know, what about things that are in danger of, be, of being um, degraded or deteriorating and need to be digitised faster so that we don't lose them? Good, good point, yep. I can say that through the work that I've done over the years now, um, libraries, archives, they do actually have a very uh, organic kind of a way of deciding what is going to be funded by time of their volunteers, their staff, and really money as well. Because sometimes they have received a donation from another institution that is looking for a place to store you know, the physical uh, Ah, so yeah. So that can be a trigger. Good point. It can be the trigger that they have received a donation from someone, and this person is associated by, let's say, the editor. Uh, I have an example, for instance, the Jesse Street. Hang on, wait. Let me let me repeat what you said so far, and then continue. So Irma's saying that in her work um, in in these institutions, she she finds that often it's a very organic process that a donation can come from somewhere to preserve a particular artifact that needs a new home or. Um, or a particular collection gets moved from, from one place to another and that spurs the, uh, you know, because there's space, not, not enough space to store it or something. So, so, for instance, there was an example for Sydney of a group of women who were doctors at uh, the RPA hospital. They actually created a, news, a newspaper, if you like, a newsletter. Well, it was more like a, a newspaper to look at all of the women who were in the medical profession and this is about the 1960s, who realised that their pay was much lower than the, you know, huh. the counterparts. Had okay, so in the medical there's an ex a doctor donated plenty of money, and this digitisation progress, you know, process is now happening. Fantastic, awesome, interest. awesome. So. Um, to try and summarise, um, a really great example of sort of in the 60s or 70s, um, a group of women doctors here in Sydney um, found a, a, a founded a newspaper, a sort of newsletter newspaper, to um, share knowledge about uh, the pay, the fact that they were receiving less pay and working together. And someone has come forward who had funding um, to support that and digitise that work. Fantastic, and it, it, it served to create awareness that um, of the of the story and um, of the campaign that they were running. Awesome, thank you, Irma. Now I'm going to take Fiona and yeah, Fiona first. So, um, first to your question about how things are prioritised for digitisation, um, I know that. I know that the British Library is doing a lot of work to digitise its collection, um, but partly what's been driving that has actually been the physical size of the books, um, that really, really big books and really, really tiny books are much harder to digitise. So it tends to be things which are about the size of a modern trade paperback that are digitised first simply for it's logistic easier. reasons because it's easier. And things you know which are really fragile and likely to fall apart maybe um, are not being digitised. Um, but um, getting back to the question of sort of which Donna originally posed about how can you know communities um, s perhaps support this work, um, I think it's really important that in wanting to do this that we um, that we talk to the cultural institutions in question. Um, that the worst thing for somebody from a, a really small archive or a, a tiny museum is for you know enthusiasts from the tech community to turn up and announce that they're here to help. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, um, it, which it can be very resource intensive for a, um, a glam institution to support a digitization project. And if you're running on two staff members to dedicate somebody's time 
to a digitization project, that may not be a priority for the institution. So, um, yeah, I think making sure that, you know, we have this enthusiasm that, yes, everything must be online and open access, um, actually really making sure that, that we're having the right conversations with um, the GLAM sector organizations and are providing meaningful assistance. Um, <laughs> that is a really, really great point. Now, can I just go here for proximity? <laughs> Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to, to, to what Fiona was saying around that, that we, we need to understand that that process of digitisation that happens in um, institutions, you actually are taking several steps before you get to that end product. There is the description and contextual information that needs to be created. So you need to have catalogue records or some sort of archival description around it. You may need to have preservation work that goes into it. Um, and all of those things cost money, but they're not um, they're not so glamorous as actually having the thing up on the screen. So there's many, many steps before getting to it's all out there. And sometimes with our enthusiasm, we may forget that back work that needs to, to happen. You know, we don't often think of our catalogues, catalogues as stars. They are, mm -hmm. um, but, but it's not that public front facing work. So I, I think just adding to that, it's so much bigger what needs to happen before we get to that end product. Thank you, Bonnie. Yeah, the meaning is in the metadata, right? OK, I'm going to run all the way over to the other side of the room. No, 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 it's good. It's just a little awkward. Oh, you all right? Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. Sorry. <laughs> so can you hear me? OK, yeah. So uh, I, I think about this from a different perspective. I mean, the ground the groundwork that people at the at libraries and all can do is really great, and I appreciate their conservation efforts. I'm thinking about it what well, we can actually petition our governments to actually provide to help us with it, and like the thing that I've seen by watching digitization pro dig digitization projects. I'm sorry, I'm great at speaking. If you can't tell, it, from like you know Project Gutenberg on, is that you get highly varying quality and varying document formats for people doing things, and if we can like adopt sort of reasonable open document standards and like common tools to do this, then we get a lot of value out of that. And they're able to say, hey, these documents are all searchable in the same way. They're all viewable in the same way. You don't have to buy extra software to look at them. They'll stay open forever. And then finally, once you've got those products to get them out to people, like to me, it seems like the one thing to petition with the government is like hosting. If this is free for everybody to look at, then how about, the, how about we add the, ask the government to collectively host things? Because the cost for that's not that high. And it's hard for libraries to support that. Yeah, interesting point. Okay, you. Excellent proximity. Yes. Sorry, just while you're on this side of the room. Um, this doesn't actually answer this question, but I just wanted to go back to that question of who decides um, and why are some things prioritised over others. So if you look at, um, again, our favourite um, government repository of, of documents at Trove, you may get the impression that there was a lot more news in um, the years between like 1914 to 1919 and then the years 1939 to, you know, 1945. <laughs> um, so when the federal government decides that they, you know, want to celebrate our military history, which they seem to do at an alarmingly frequent rate, um, what they do is that they give grant money to digitisation projects so that we can digitise all of these military records and news records relating to it. And so um, actually a whole bunch, you know, we were talking about those, those newspaper digitisation projects, a whole bunch of stuff actually got pushed off the list when the federal government decided that, oh, hang on, it's, it's the, you know, 100th anniversary of the Second World War. And so they prioritised those sorts of things. So, in, I mean, in some ways the answer to this is, we need some way for like normal average people to somehow influence those decisions and and perhaps lobby for um, things that aren't military history or are a little more representative um, so that we can actually kind of flatten that out a little bit. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, very good. Um, and also the other thing is um, copyright reform, copyright reform, copyright reform. <laughs> Uh, copyright reform, yeah. So the TLDR there in some ways is kind of politics, right? There are political decisions at play about what gets what gets prioritised for digitisation and, you know, what languishes. 
It also comes back to who's funding it. I have, I'm not going to get to you any, any easily, easy way. Do you have more to say as I kind of feel? Yeah. 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 It needs funding, absolutely, absolutely. So how can libraries, archives and communities work together to increase access to our cultural knowledge? I think Fiona's point is really critical, that it has to be a conversation and it has to be in partnership about the priorities of the institution in question. And I think going to Hugh's point that, you know, governments will fund things that fit their agenda. But then you've got, you know, little old me going, hey, this thing's not online and I want it to be. And I reckon I'm not the only one. And I found the seven and a half thousand dollars. I had a couple of big donors, but most of them, the average donation was between 20 and 50 bucks. Calix donated, thank you very much, Irma and Bob, as one of the, one of the bigger donors. Um, Google came on board and gave me a bunch of cash right at the end when I was in despair thinking I wouldn't get there. But, you know, the thing that really kind of worked for this was, in particular, it's feminist history. So I reached out into feminist academic networks and said, hey, this thing. And they're like, yeah, here's, here's, here's some money. And even more interestingly, a couple of members of parliament sent me cheques. And that blew me away. But the best one, and this is really just, just humour me now, I got to connect with a couple of Louisa Lawson's ancestors. Um, uh, Elizabeth Lawson was one of them and she, she also sent a donation and I had a little email exchange and I was like, oh wow, you know, that's really cool. But I think this is an example that I'm just a, you know, I'm just a, a normal, well, some people would debate normal, <laughs> but you know, I'm, I'm not a politician, you know, and I'm not at a, at a glam institute. It was just, there was a, it was a cultural artefact that I felt needed to be online. So I think there's definitely ways of doing that. I think the question is how do we activate activists to, to do it. I think the other thing is is that there's small community groups that have got no idea where to start and I think that's where Glam can sort of step in where my father for example he's part of a clock club that fixes things like the Southern Cross Station clocks every year and he's got all these books on how to fix clocks but and they're out of copyright, but he doesn't know where to start. And luckily he knows me, but <laughs> it's how do those little community groups start or find the infrastructure or funding? Yeah, I think that's a really, really good point. So, like, I think at a lot of local government um, and, and public libraries probably house local history associations. So I think that's a kind of natural alliance that you know, if the kind of resources like Caval has, there's a digitising machine just not being used. Imagine if that went to Brimbank so the Sunshine History Group could do more work, digitise more stuff about the harvester wage case or something. Just throwing things around, really. Call me on this if it's off topic. <laughs> I think there's a broader issue here too about how we vote, value cultural heritage as a society. Um, if we were saying, you know, Digitise the Dawn was a sports team and they were the first team to play sports ball in some city, <laughs> they would have been digitised 50 years ago as soon as it came out of copyright. Is there a broader issue here about placing cultural heritage and the value that it offers to society on more of a pedestal? Answers from the crowd on that one. I have my own feels. <laughs> I'll come over to Belt Bonnie. <laughs> right, right, she says. No, I mean, we have to go back to, what, a year ago where Trove was under threat of being defunded. I mean, this is insane to me that we have... Trove was a risk, right? The digitised program was a risk. But it was a literally history-changing risk. Like, we understand Australian history in totally different ways now because of Trove that it was going to be defunded and that the government stepped in and said, well, if you want money, oh, we're recording, aren't we? Yeah. Um, I love my job. Um, <laughs> no, but the, 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 the government said, um, if you want the funding, move into the private sphere, that we could erode a public good like this. I think that is hugely reflective of where we are in Australia right now, and that's terrible. Thanks, Bonnie. And it's one of the critical questions that I put up is, you know, how do we ensure it lives on if the institutions who host it are defunded? And I think, you know, it didn't happen, but who's to say it couldn't, right? Um, it, 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 I don't have an answer to this one. I think it's one of those cautionary tales we need to be constantly vigilant about. Bob. Thank you, Donna. 
Uh, I think there's a, a related uh, issue, which is our dependence on government funding. And we don't have a culture in Australia of private philanthropy to nearly the extent that that exists in other societies. And uh, so perhaps one of the strategies that could be adopted is to encourage more private philanthropy around these issues. Encouraging more private philanthropy. Yep. All right. Sort of with the, with the dawn, um, there, was, there were discussions at the time with that project around, well, why hasn't that been funded? They, they, ha they had put aside funding to do the bulletin. And there's actually been some interesting work comparing the dawn and the bulletin because they were being published at a similar time. The bulletin has continued on and is a really sort of famous Australian sort of news magazine. But they were the, were the same format and they were preparing to digitise the bulletin and it made it easy for them to digitise the dawn. I think that was going to your, um, maybe your comment about the formats that, you know, no, it was, I don't know, so someone said a smart thing about, <laughs> about the shape and size of the things that we're digitising, Fiona. You know, and and that, that does really matter. There are some really practical um, limitations and that, that make some things easier than others. So I've lost my point. Someone else needs to put their hand up to say something. All right, All right Q, I'll come back. Running, 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 running. Sorry, I feel like I'm monopolising the conversation a bit, but I just, I, I did feel like I need to throw this in to the mix, it goes to the question of cultural priorities and culture generally. Um, so I happened to read um, a keynote from actually a couple of years ago now uh, by um, Tara Robertson, who's a Canadian librarian. And her keynote was called Not All Information Wants to be Free. And I think this is actually an important consideration, particularly here in Australia. Um, her specific example was a uh, the digitisation of a um, a journal that was no longer in print, called On Our Backs, which is a lesbian porn magazine, um, and you know it was very important in the lives of that community for a while while it was in publication. And initially, she thought, "Oh, this is great! You know, that was such a great." cultural touchstone for, for this community and and then she suddenly realized that some of her friends who had appeared in that magazine had done so um, in very different circumstances to now so it ran from 1984 to 2004 um, and they had never considered that it might be available decontextualized to the entire world, you know, this was this was a community document that was, um, you know, you could only get in certain bookstores and and that sort of thing. Um, now, very different context, but similar problems uh, with a lot of indigenous culture, where um, you know there are um, there are pieces of cultural information that only certain people should know um, in in that cultural tradition. Uh, and this is, you know, this is in all sorts of um, different communities around the world. And we do need to be a bit careful about kind of making a blanket assumption that, you know, all the world's culture should be freely available and digitised. And that's probably something we need to think about when we're thinking about what's prioritised. Because um, you can go down a rabbit hole and, you know, expend a whole bunch of energy on on things that probably shouldn't be digitised when we really should be picking the uh, the low hanging fruit and digitising the stuff that everyone's kind of comfortable with. That is a really really excellent point, and there are lots of examples of that where there is um, private and secret knowledge which is for a particular um, group or community. One of the ones that I've bumped up against is um, very uh, explicit. Uh, material for medical education, uh, where the people involved in the, the people who were, you know, acting, pretending to sort of basically have terrible things wrong with them, so that doctors could pretend and practice, and this was filmed and made. Of, so this is made available to medical students, but really those people never agreed for that to be, you know, publicly available online. So, like the cultural, um, the the cultural kind of sort of blacklisting of stuff like this is secret business and, and is only for our eyes and um, great example with the lesbian porn magazine I think that that there really are these kinds of issues but 
having the conversation and making some decisions about what is and isn't um, appropriate to be digitised and how it should be made available or not and the metadata around it. This is all part of this challenge, right? So great, great point. Thank you, Hugh. Um, I'm going to just step back to the what can and should we do with this knowledge once it's freely available, which I think points to that. Thanks, Irma. Um, some of it shouldn't be freely available, I think, is the takeaway there, right? And it shouldn't go online. Or should it be digitised but put in some kind of protected fashion so that only those people who have the right access to it can access it? You know, I think these are really difficult questions. Well, maybe they're not so difficult, but they're important questions that we should respond on. Sorry, no, I think no. um, that is exactly what is happening with some open source software that was actually written in Australia. And that is exactly what is happening with some open source software that was written in Australia for exactly that purpose. Thanks, Hugh. Maybe we can talk about, do a lightning talk about that software? Okay, well, give us some clues and pointers later. Any, any other comments on, on this thing about, you know, what we, what we choose to not make available? Kathy. Are there biases in what we choose to make available? Because who makes those decisions? Absolutely. Are there biases in what we choose to make available? Uh, we can't. Of course, yeah, you know, whoever makes that decision has, is coming from some perspective or other. And are the people who are making the decisions the ones with the resources and the people who are finding that their stuff is not accessible the ones who don't? It's the bulletin versus the dawn. The bulletin versus the dawn. Big questions. No answers. <laughs> not from me, anyway. But I'll, I'll happily ask them. I have a question about how we can see. How, how can we see? what we can see and what we can't see, going back to your un unknown unknowns. Um, are, those, are there lists of things that haven't yet been digitised that then perhaps people could be asked to help make decisions about? So how do we involve people in those implementation decisions or even the policy decisions about what we prioritise? An excellent question from um, Kat, Kat here from Open Australia. Um, thoughts? No. No thoughts. <laughs> Plenty of thoughts. But um, actually, open, I, I'm, I'm on the board of Open Australia, a bit of a disclaimer. Um, Kat and I and, and Matthew are doing some strategy work. And one of the things that we're talking about is Open Australia is about hacking democracy. And perhaps these kinds of lists that our institutions might have about things that they, collections they have and decisions they may or may not be making about what should maybe, maybe that should be made more open and transparent. Maybe there should be public engagement processes around um, how those decisions get made, what the priority, um, what, what criteria we use to make some of those decisions. I'm running over to Bonnie now who has her hand up. Um, I would say that we can find that out. We can go to the State Library of New South Wales website and we could do a search for journals published before 1950 and we would get hundreds and thousands of titles to choose from. Um, so our clockmakers here could ask that question, State Library, what have you got? And you would find a little 1900s publication um, based on that and then you'd lobby for that to be digitised. So those lists are there um, in those big institutional collections and also in our small public libraries. They're available via their library catalogues. Are library catalogues friendly to use, Hugh? Are library catalogues? Shall we talk about Mark? Do you want to talk about how good Mark is? How good's Mark? Um, so so it's, it then comes down to, I think, how do we extract that content, content and those lists and that kind of information from these library catalogues and then make it accessible and friendly? And then how do we start that conversation with the institutions to say, hey, you've got this obscure thing that my group is interested in. Let's make it accessible. Yeah. Thanks, Bonnie. I think actually I, I, I want to kind of riff on that because I think bringing together um, local in, like interest groups, whether they're ge geographically local or distributed around a particular community of interest, um, is what's kind of interesting here. Uh, like for instance, labour history. A, a lot of small unions got swallowed up by larger unions into large, you know, super unions. Um, but most of them had a publication of some kind, some kind of journal or newsletter that went out, and a lot of them are in archives. Now there's some really interesting stuff 
in those. And there's probably similar things for all sorts of civil society associations of one kind or another. Like imagine, imagine the minutes of the Country Women's Association in all sorts of little local places about the who's who's and for family histories, because they're probably documenting, oh, we've got a, unfortunately we've got a funeral next week and we all need to make the, you know, the sandwiches and the lamingtons and make sure that everyone's, you know, well, well teed and watered. You know, there's all sorts of really interesting different nooks and crannies where our information is. Some of it's secret, which we want to leave and protect for very good reasons, but some of it's just, you know, great kind of cultural history that we could, we could be enriched. Well, I'm preaching, I have the microphone. Um, <laughs> But, you know, I think, I think that's worth exploring. So how do we connect those kinds of groups with just the knowledge of asking their local library to uncover what's around? Kathy. So, first of all, I think Kat had her hand up before and I don't want to... All right, fine. Hang on. Kat first and then Kathy. <laughs> uh, it was a quick technical question. What, um, what format are those catalogues in currently? So do we have to go and look them up in a book or are they in a digital form? <laughs> this is good. I haven't had this much exercise today. Yeah, and hey. Get the wine. Let's start this. Okay, um, so you will have your um, library online library catalogues, library, library catalogue records, and they are um, in MARC coding. Um, you may have some resources sitting in a um, card catalogue, but overwhelmingly, there are, um, even if they're just scant, there are online um, records. And what does the Mark catalogue tell us about the um, information that's stored? Oh, all sorts of things. Yeah, so, um, so Mark coding is a standardised language that's used across um, libraries. So um, the whole idea is that those library catalogue records could be shared um, so that they were in that standard format. So they will tell you um, whatever you want to know. So publication dates, um, place of publication, the publisher, um, you'll have information about whether it's illustrated, you'll have information about the size of it, um, pages, all of that kind of stuff. So we could visualise that and do a cultural audit and see whether overwhelmingly stuff is being digitised that's from a military historical yeah. background or what are our underrepresented digital assets yeah. that we currently I have it. available. I love it. Zachary, Could I we? <laughs> so, yes, let's smash through Anzac Uri. Um, who's, who's familiar with WILPF? It's its worst acronym ever. The Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Cat is. Anyone else? No. So this organisation, it's kind of little chapters all, the way, all around the world. And they had a massive gathering of women, like thousands of women, met somewhere in Europe, I can't remember the city, the same week in 1915 as Gallipoli, the sort of horror of Gallipoli. And they met to try and stop the horrors of war. And we have put so much money into commemorating, you know, the horror and so little into the very real efforts to stop it and to, to do things to prevent that kind of thing and to build international diplomacy. And that, I think that's an example of you know, what Cathy was saying about what, what we choose to um, protect, preserve and promote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how are we going for time? I'm just, are we up? We're up. So <laughs> let, me, let me sum up, well, not, not that I really can. I, I really want to just say thank you. Um, I really just wanted to have a conversation. I feel like the, the effort that you know, went into the Digitise the Dawn campaign and the money that people put into it and that people have since you know, found it useful and people continue to fix, you know, fix stuff that's in there and online is just fantastic. And I just feel like let's not have that be a one-off. It wasn't really all that difficult and it wasn't actually a lot of money. All it really took was a bit of persistence and probably a, a lot of annoying, you know, people being annoyed by my kind of activity in the, in the space and saying, oh God, just shut up and here's some money or something. But, you know, there's probably lots of things out there. If we can connect the dots, if one of the things we do as communities is to make, build bridges like we've, we kind of have done today, then, then we're kind of taking a step in the right direction. 
Please get in touch with me if you've got any questions. Please follow Digitise the Dawn. There's like, she only got about 160 followers or something. It's a bit sad. And I've got nearly 3,000. Yay! And, and your bonus for following the Digitise the Dawn is you get a tasty treat once a day from the pages um, of the Dawn. So thank you very much for humouring us today.